Okay, so there, it's already set. Oh, you didn't have the recorder? Oh, let me get it over there. Okay. Okay, I'm going to do your speed building today. It's jury charge. I'll start at 160 and go through 190. Um, what's it come out on your speed building? I think the only proper name is Mark L. DeVitt. Mark L. DeVitt. Okay, and this will be at 160 for five minutes. Ready? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, a person commits the crime of murder in the second degree if he knowingly causes the death of a person, but not after deliberation. The elements of murder in the second degree are therefore one, knowingly, and two, causing the death of a person, three, but not after deliberation. If, after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Mark L. DeVitt, acted in such a manner as to satisfy all of the above elements at or about the date and place stated in the indictment, you should find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty of murder in the second degree. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the offense charged, he may, however, be found guilty of any lesser included offense, the commission of which is necessarily included in the offense charged if the evidence is sufficient to establish his guilt of, a, of such lesser included offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The offense of murder in the second degree as charged in the information in this case necessarily includes the lesser offense of heat of passion manslaughter. A person commits the crime of heat of passion manslaughter if he knowingly causes the death of another person under circumstances where the act causing the death was performed not after deliberation and upon a sudden heat of passion and caused by a serious and highly provoking act and affecting the person killing sufficiently to excite an irresistible passion in a reasonable person. But if between the provocation and the killing there is an interval sufficient for the voice of reason and humanity to be heard, the killing is murder. The elements of heat of passion manslaughter are therefore one, knowingly causing the death of another person, two, under circumstances where the act causing the death was performed, a, not after deliberation, and B, upon a sudden heat of passion, and C, caused by a serious and highly provoking act, and D, affecting the person killing sufficiently to excite an irresistible passion in a reasonable person. Three, but if between the provocation and the killing there is an interval sufficient for the voice of reason and humanity to be heard, the killing is murder. The jury will bear in mind that the burden is always upon the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt each and every material element of any lesser offense which is necessarily included in any offense charged in the information. The law never imposes upon a defendant in a criminal case the burden of calling any witnesses or producing any evidence. If after considering all of the evidence you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Mark L. DeVitt, committed the crime charged or a lesser included offense, you should so state in your verdict. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty and should so state in your verdict. You are not in any event to find the defendant, Mark L. DeVitt, guilty of more than one of the following offenses, murder in the second degree, heat of passion manslaughter. Of course, you may find the defendant not guilty of both of these offenses. 
Diminished responsibility due to self-inflicted intoxication is not a defense to murder in the second degree and heat of passion manslaughter. To warrant conviction, the death must be the natural and probable consequence of the unlawful act and not the result of an independent intervening cause in which the accused does not participate and which he could not foresee. If it appears that the act of the accused was not the proximate cause of the death for which he is being prosecuted, but that another cause intervened with which he was in no way connected, but for which death would have not occurred, such supervening cause is a defense to the charge of homicide. Mere negligence on the part of a physician attending the victim is not such a supervening cause because such negligence is foreseeable. Only gross negligence on the part of the attending physician, which is not reasonably foreseeable, constitutes a defense if, but for that gross negligence, death would not have resulted. A physician acts with gross negligence with respect to a result or to a circumstance at issue when he fails to perceive a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the result will occur or that the circumstance exists. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that the failure to perceive it constitutes gross deviation from the standard of care that a reasonable physician in the same Okay, this will be at 170. <clears throat> Ready? <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, a person commits the crime of murder in the second degree if he knowingly causes the death of a person but not after deliberation. The elements of murder in the second degree are therefore one, knowingly, and two, causing the death of a person, three, but not after deliberation. If after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Mark L. DeVitt, acted in such a manner as to satisfy all of the above elements at or about the date and place stated in the indictment, you should find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty of murder in the second degree. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the offense charged, he may, however, be found guilty of any lesser included offense, the commission of which is necessarily included in the offense charged, if the evidence is sufficient to establish his guilt of such lesser included offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The offense of murder in the second degree as charged in the information in this case necessarily includes the lesser offense of heat of passion manslaughter. A person commits the crime of heat of passion manslaughter if he knowingly causes the death of another person under circumstances where the act causing the death was performed not after deliberation and upon a sudden heat of passion and caused by a serious and highly provoking act and affecting the person killing sufficiently to excite an irresistible passion in a reasonable person. But if between the provocation and the killing there is an interval sufficient for the voice of reason and humanity to be heard, the killing is murder. The elements of heat of passion manslaughter are therefore one, knowingly causing the death of another person, two, under circumstances where the act causing the death was performed, a, not after deliberation, and b, upon a sudden heat of passion, and c, caused by a serious and highly provoking act, and d, affecting the person killing sufficiently to excite an irresistible passion in a reasonable person. Three, but if between the provocation and the killing there is an interval sufficient for the voice of reason and humanity to be heard, the killing is murder. The jury will bear in mind that the burden is always upon the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt each and every material element of any lesser offense, which is necessarily included in any offense charged in the information. The law never imposes upon a defendant in a criminal case the burden of calling any witnesses or producing any evidence. After, if, after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Mark L. DeVitt, committed the crime charged or a lesser included offense, you should so state in your verdict. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty and should so state in your verdict. You are not in any event 
to find the defendant, Mark L. DeWitt, guilty of more than one of the following offenses, murder in the second degree, heat of passion, manslaughter. Of course, you may find the defendant not guilty of both of these offenses. Diminished responsibility due to self-inflicted intoxication is not a defense to murder in the second degree and heat of passion manslaughter. To warrant conviction, the death must be the natural and probable consequence, consequence of the unlawful act and not the result of an independent intervening cause in which the accused does not participate and which he could not foresee. If it appears that the act of the accused was not the proximate cause of the death for which he is being prosecuted, but that another cause intervened with which he was in no way connected and but for which death would not have occurred, such supervening causes and events to the charge of homicide. Mere negligence on the part of a physician attending the victim is not such a supervening cause because such negligence is foreseeable. Only gross negligence on the part of the attending physician which is not reasonably foreseeable, constitutes a defense if, but for that gross negligence, death would not have resulted. A physician acts with gross negligence with respect to a result or to a circumstance at issue when he fails to perceive a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the result will occur or that the circumstance exists. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that the failure to perceive it constitutes gross deviation from the standard of care that a reasonable position in the same or similar community would observe in the situation. The fact that the victim died from the combined effects of a pre-existing disease or condition and the wound inflicted by his attacker does not provide a defense to murder in the second degree and manslaughter. The offense of murder in the second degree as charged in the information in Okay, this will be at 180. Ready? <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, a person commits a crime of murder in the second degree if he knowingly causes the death of a person, but not after deliberation. The elements of murder in the second degree are therefore one, knowingly, and two, causing the death of a person, three, but not after deliberation. If after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Mark L. DeVitt, acted in such a manner as to satisfy all of the above elements that are about the date and place stated in the indictment, you should find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty of murder in the second degree. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the offense charged, he may, however, be found guilty of any lesser included offense, the commission of which is necessarily included in the offense charged, if the evidence is sufficient to establish his guilt of such lesser included offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The offense of murder in the second degree, as charged in the information in this case, necessarily includes the lesser offense of heat of passion manslaughter. A person commits a crime of heat of passion manslaughter if, he knowingly causes the death of another person under circumstances where the act causing the death was performed not after deliberation and upon a sudden heat of passion and caused by a serious and highly provoking act and affecting the person killing sufficiently to excite an irresistible passion in a reasonable person. But if between the provocation and the killing there is an interval sufficient for the voice of reason and humanity to be heard, the killing is murder. The elements of heat of passion manslaughter are therefore one, knowingly causing the death of another person, two, under circumstances where the act causing the death was performed, A, not after deliberation, and B, upon a sudden heat of passion, and C, caused by a serious and highly provoking act, and D, affecting the person killing sufficiently to excite an irresistible passion in a reasonable person. Three, but if between the provocation and the killing there is an interval sufficient for the voice of reason and humanity to be heard, the killing is murder. The jury will bear in mind that the burden is always upon the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt each and every material element of any lesser offense which is necessarily included in any offense charged in the information. The law never imposes upon a defendant in a criminal case the burden of calling any witnesses or producing any evidence. If after considering all of the evidence you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt 
that the defendant, Mark L. DeVitt, committed the crime charged of a lesser included offense, you should so state in your verdict. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty and should so state in your verdict. You are not in any event to find the defendant, Mark L. DeVitt, guilty of more than one of the following offenses. Murder in the second degree, heat of passion, manslaughter. Of course, you may find the defendant not guilty of both of these offenses. Diminished responsibility due to self-inflicted intoxication is not a defense to murder in the second degree and heat of passion manslaughter. To warrant conviction, the death must be the natural and probable consequence of the unlawful act and not the result of an independent intervening cause in which the accused does not participate and which he could not foresee. If it appears that the act of the accused was not the proximate cause of the death for which he is being prosecuted, but that another cause intervened with which he is in no way connected and but for which death would not have occurred, such supervening cause is a defense to charge to the charge of homicide. Mere negligence on the part of a physician attending the victim is not such a supervening cause because such negligence is foreseeable. Only gross negligence on the part of the attending physician, which is not reasonably foreseeable, constitutes a defense if, but for that gross negligence, death would not have resulted. A physician acts with gross negligence with respect to a result or to a circumstance at issue when he fails to perceive a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the result will occur or that the circumstance exists. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that the failure to perceive it constitutes gross deviation from the standard of care that a reasonable physician in the same or similar community would observe in the situation. The fact that the victim died from the combined effects of a pre-existing disease or condition and the wound inflicted by his attacker does not provide a defense to murder in the second degree and manslaughter. The offense of murder in the second degree, as charged in the information in this case, necessarily includes the lesser offense of reckless manslaughter. A person commits a crime of reckless manslaughter if he recklessly causes the death of another person. The elements of reckless manslaughter are therefore one, acting recklessly, and two, causing the death of another person. Okay. Okay, class, so I'm back, and this is going to be 190. Let me see. Um, don't forget, manslaughter is final MS with an asterisk. Uh, self-inflicted is self, S-E-F-L, inflict, and then D. It'll give you the hyphen. And then you've got humanity is human, is human, and then T, I. Okay, and then you've got um, establish is blish, B-L-I-R-B, establish. And then you've got second murder in the second degree is M-U-F-R-D. M-U. Let me see. Murder in the second degree. Uh, you have. M-U-K-D with an asterisk, M-U-K-D with an asterisk, okay? Murder in the second degree. And this is going to be, then you all, justifiable is J-U-F-B-L, J-U-F-B-L. And this is going to be at 190. Ladies and gentlemen, a person commits the crime of murder in the second degree if he knowingly causes the death of a person, but not after deliberation. The elements of murder in the second degree are therefore, one, knowingly, and two, causing the death of a person, three, <coughs> but not after deliberation. If after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Mark L. DeVitt, acted in such a manner so as to satisfy all of the above elements, at or about the date and place stated in the information, you should find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty in the, of murder in the second degree. 
if you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the offense charged, he may, however, be found guilty of any lesser included offense, the commission of which is necessarily included in the offense charged if the evidence is sufficient to establish his guilt of such lesser included offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The offense of murder in the second degree as charged in the information in this case necessarily includes the lesser offense of heat of passion manslaughter. A person commits the crime of heat of passion manslaughter if he knowingly caused the death of another person under circumstances where the act causing the death was performed not after deliberation and upon a sudden heat of passion and caused by a serious and highly provoking act and affecting the person killing sufficiently to excite an irresistible passion in a reasonable person. But if between the provocation and the killing there is an interval sufficient for the voice of reason and humanity to be heard, the killing is murder. The elements of heat of passion manslaughter are therefore one knowingly causing the death of another person to under circumstances where the act causing the death was performed, A, not after deliberation, and B, upon a sudden heat of passion, and C, caused by a serious and highly provoking act, and D, affecting the person killing sufficiently to excite an irresistible passion in a reasonable person. Three, but if between the provocation and the killing there is an interval sufficient for the voice of reason and humanity to be heard, the killing is murder. The jury will bear in mind that the burden is always upon the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt each and every material element of any lesser offense which is necessarily included in any offense charged in the information and the law never imposes upon a defendant in a criminal case the burden of calling any witnesses or producing any evidence. If after considering all of the evidence you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant Mark L. DeVitt committed the crime charged or a lesser included offense, you should so state in your verdict if you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty and should so state in your verdict, you are not in any event to find the defendant Mark L. DeVitt guilty of more than one of the following offenses. Murder in the second degree, heat of passion, manslaughter. Of course, you may find the defendant not guilty of both of these offenses. Diminished responsibility due to inflicted intoxication is not a defense to murder in the second degree and heat of passion, manslaughter. To warrant conviction, the death must be the natural and probable consequence of the unlawful act and not the result of an independent intervening cause in which the accused does not participate and which he could not foresee. If it appears that the act of the accused was not the proximate cause of the death for which he is being prosecuted, but that another cause intervened with which he was in no way connected, but for which death would not have occurred, such supervening cause is a defense to the charge of homicide. Mere negligence on the part of a physician attending the victim is not such a supervening cause because such negligence is foreseeable. Only gross negligence on the part of the attending physician, which is not reasonably foreseeable, constitutes a defense if for that gross negligence, death would not have resulted. A physician acts with gross negligence with respect to a result or to a circumstance at issue when he fails to perceive a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the result will occur or that the circumstance exists. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that the failure to perceive it constitutes gross deviation from the standard of care that a reasonable physician in the same or a similar community would observe in the situation. The fact that the victim died from the combined effects of a pre-existing disease or condition and the wound inflicted by his attacker does not provide a defense to murder in the second degree and manslaughter. The offense of murder in the second degree as charged in the information in this case necessarily includes the lesser offense of reckless manslaughter. A person commits a crime of reckless manslaughter if he recklessly causes the death of another person. The elements of reckless manslaughter are therefore one, acting recklessly and two, causing the death of another person. Okay, and so physician real quickly is FGS, physician initial F final GS. And then you've got element is LMT, element LMT, homicide is HDZ, HDZ, negligence is NEGS, negligence, NEJS. And then you've got irresistible is irresist BL. No. Stroke it out then, irresistible, okay? And we'll get ready for your test, you all.
so we have On your test number one, we have proper names, 180 jury charge, power low is one word and it's in uh, quotes, power low. Let me make sure there isn't anything else. That's it. So this is gonna be then 180 jury charge number one for five minutes, you all. Let me just make this big. Five minutes, 180 jury charge. Members of the jury, this is a personal injury case in which the defendant is the owner operator of a small beauty salon in our city. The plaintiff is seeking in this action to recover from the defendant the sum of $200,000 in damages which she claims were caused to her by the negligent manner in which the defendant performed a process in his salon that is known as a Facial peel. Negligence is the legal concept that forms the framework of fault in most personal injury lawsuits. In her complaint, the plaintiff alleges that the defendant performed a facial peel with the use of a chemical and did the work in such a negligent manner that she was burned by the chemical and suffered scarring that has permanently damaged the skin on her face. Chemical facial peels have been found in the past to be harmful to skin, but that is also dependent on how they are applied. The defendant denies the allegations of the plaintiff so far as they relate to the claim of negligence in the manner in which the chemical facial peel was applied to the skin of the plaintiff. Negligence can best be explained by giving you some of the key elements that go into a negligence claim, and they are the duty of care and the breach of that duty. Duty of care is a legal term that refers to the responsibility that one person has to avoid causing harm to another person. In a personal injury lawsuit, the first step in proving that one person's actions toward another were negligent is to establish that he or she had a duty of care in the situation that gave rise to the injury inflicted on the plaintiff. The plaintiff who is the injured person in this case will need to show you how the other party the defendant failed to meet that duty of care in applying the chemical peel to her face. In other words, it is the duty of the plaintiff to prove to you that the defendant's conduct breached that duty of care. If the plaintiff proves to you, then the next step in proving the negligence of the defendant is to prove that the plaintiff suffered real injuries that were caused by that breach. For a plaintiff in a personal injury case demonstrating a breach of care requires showing that the actions taken or not taken by the defendant failed to meet the required level of reasonable care under the circumstances. What did the defendant do or fail to do that made his conduct unreasonable? In other words, how exactly should the defendant be considered legally at fault for causing the plaintiff's injury should you find that he did? Now, in some cases, a plaintiff's own conduct may have played a role in causing his or her injuries alongside the defendant's negligence. We refer to this as contributory negligence. Did the plaintiff in this case contribute in any way to the injury she has suffered? As you listen to the opening words of counsel for the plaintiff and counsel for the defendant, know that what they have to say here is not evidence. They are merely summing up what they expect to prove here today, but they were not witnesses to anything. What the attorneys say to the jury is never to be construed as testimony. The testimony is what you hear from those who take the stand and take the oath to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Some of those who take the stand today will support the claims of the plaintiff and some of them will support the claims of the defendant. You must not count the number of witnesses each side has and the use and use that as a barometer. In our legal system, it is the quality of a witness's testimony, not the quantity of witnesses that makes a difference. It is not just the number of witnesses that one side has over the other side, but the credibility of the testimony of any one or more witness. In this case today, we will be hearing from one or two expert witnesses. I believe each side has one here to testify. Each of them are considered expert in their field, and in this case, they are both deemed expert in the field of chemicals, and in particular, the specific chemicals that are part of the facial peel received by the plaintiff. 
the product the defendant used on the plaintiff is called Power Glow, and its chemical components will be brought to your attention through the testimony of expert witnesses. An expert witness is someone who has been specially trained or who has experience in a particular area. In cases that are tried in our courts, both civil and criminal, witnesses may testify only to facts that are within their knowledge. By that is meant that they can only testify to things that they have personally seen or heard or felt. But in a number of cases, issues come up that are beyond our experience. And in those types of cases, we allow a person with special training to testify. Unlike other witnesses, these experts are asked to testify not only to the facts, but to give their opinions. They are asked to give the reasons for their opinions on... Okay, and then we have your second 180 jury charge, proper names that come out. You have Orleans Parish, Mary Beth Walker, and People. Make sure you capitalize court when you can replace judge in the sentence. That does come out, okay? This is going to be 180 jury charge number two for five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, as you go in to deliberate, I want to tell you once more, you are to decide the defendant's guilt or innocence on the evidence and on it alone. The evidence in this case consists of the verbal testimony of witnesses and the exhibits which have been marked and received in evidence. The exhibits are just as much a part of the evidence as are all the spoken words of the witnesses. But you are to ignore answers of witnesses that were stricken out, all those which the court ordered stricken or matters which were not allowed in the evidence. The only factor which may properly influence your review is the duly admitted evidence before you. In the course of the trial, from time to time, questions arose on matters of law. You should not concern yourselves with any of the rulings which were made by the court on such questions of law. These rulings are not part of the evidence in the case and must not be considered by you, nor are you to consider any colloquy which the court may have had with counsel. Such colloquy or any statement made by the court or counsel is not part of the evidence, and so you must not consider it in your deliberations. And you should not draw from any rulings or statements or mannerisms of the court or from any questions asked by the court the inference that the court has an opinion as to the guilt or innocence of the accused. The court has no such opinion. That is purely your duty as the members of the jury. Also, under no circumstances must the jury deem any statement by me, the court, or any words of mine toward their counsel or any tone of my voice or expression of my, my manner as a personal reflection on counsel. The final issue in this trial must be decided by you, the jury, regardless of what counsel or the trial court may think or say on the subject. An important factor to bear in mind at all times is that the quality of the testimony is controlling, not the amount of the testimony or the number of witnesses speaking for one side or the other. I will now cover the law specifically applying to the crimes which I am submitting for your review. I know that I shall continue to have your whole attention to what I am about to say. The indictment charges that the defendant in Orleans Parish and on or about March 24, 1995, willfully, feloniously, and with malice, did shoot and kill Mary Beth Walker with a gun. Homicide is the killing of one human being by the act or the omission of another. Here the people contend, and it is stated in the charge, that the deceased Mary Beth Walker was killed through the act of this defendant. Now, there are different degrees of homicide, namely murder in the first degree or the second degree and manslaughter in the first degree or second degree. In this case, we are concerned only with the crimes of murder in the first degree as a felony murder, murder in the second degree, and manslaughter in the first degree. We are not concerned here with manslaughter in the second degree. There are also different types of homicide with which this case is not concerned. I see no point in elaborating on these since if I should do so, it may only confuse and prolong this charge. The killing of a human being is murder in the first degree when done with a certain and pre-planned design to effect the death of the person killed or of another. And this is generally referred to as direct and premeditated murder. The killing of a human being is also murder in the first degree when done without a plan to cause the death of a person by a person engaged in the commission of 
or in trying to commit a felony upon or affecting the person killed or some other person. And such a killing is referred to as a felony murder or murder in the first degree as a felony murder. In other words, in order to find the defendant guilty of felony murder in the first degree, it is not needed that the people prove that the defendant thought and planned on a way to kill Mary Beth Walker. In order for you to find him guilty of a murder in the first degree as a felony murder. In order to find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree as a felony murder, you must find that the defendant killed and de the deceased while engaged in the doing of a felony, in this case robbery. But bear in mind that if you find the defendant did have a design or intent to kill the deceased, that fact does not prevent you from finding the defendant guilty of felony murder if you should find that the people have shown his guilt of that crime. Murder in the second degree is the killing of a human being when done with a plan that is an intent to cause the death of the person killed or of another but without deliberation or planning. Thus, in murder in the second degree, just as in felony murder, intent and planning form And then we have your 160s. Okay, we have on your 160 number one, jury charge, you have defendant Chong, count four, count five, count six, count seven. Mr. Chong, RICO, all caps. 47th Avenue, City of Dayton. This is gonna be 160 jury charge number one for five minutes. Defendant Chong is charged with committing federal crimes and state crimes in the indictment. The federal crimes include, but are not limited to the following counts. Count four, intent to commit murder. Count five, distribution of heroin. Count six, distribution of cocaine. Count seven, extortion. Now the indictment also alleges that Mr. Chong engaged in state crimes, which are acts that fall under the RICO statute. The state crimes of arson and extortion that are alleged to have been committed also fall under the RICO statute. I will now instruct you on the elements of each of these crimes. In order to find the defendant guilty of the state law of arson, the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about September 21, 2014, the defendant willfully engaged in the crime of arson and burned down a structure to wit 229 47th Avenue in the city of Dayton. In order to find that defendant guilty of the crime of extortion, the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about January 2012 through May 2015, defendant Chong and others, known and unknown, obtained money from restaurants and nightclubs in the city of Dayton through the wrongful use of fear. Wrongful use of fear is extortion, which is the threat to do injury to another person or property. If you find that the government has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the crimes of arson and extortion, you must then decide whether or not that forms a pattern of racketeering activity that is defined by two or more acts that have a relationship to each other. In addition to those acts, the indictment alleges that Mr. Chong collected unlawful debts during the following time periods, May 2012 to June 2012, and February 2013 to May 2013. Now, an unlawful debt is defined as a debt which in whole or in part is collected with interest on a loan that is at least twice the rate that is enforceable under the law of this state. In order for the defendant to be found guilty of this crime, the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there was an agreement during the time periods above between the defendant and at least one other person to participate in the collection of unlawful debts. Now, a conspiracy is a kind of criminal partnership or an agreement of two or more persons to commit one or more crimes. The crime is the agreement to do something unlawful. It doesn't matter whether or not the crime agreed upon by the two or more persons was committed. What you must find, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, 
is that there was a plan to commit the crimes alleged in the indictment as part of a conspiracy. Now, a conspiracy may last for a long period of time and it may include the doing of many acts or at least the doing of more than just the one act. It is not necessary that all of the members join in the doing of the criminal act at the same time. Now, once a person becomes a member of the conspiracy, that person remains a member until that person withdraws from it. One may withdraw by doing acts which are not in keeping with the intent of the other members and by making a reasonable effort to tell them about those acts. It is not a defense that a person was only a part of a conspiracy for a short period of time. Now, each member of a conspiracy is responsible for the actions of the other members, and if just one member commits a crime, the other members have also, under the law, committed the crime. Therefore, you may find that the defendant is guilty of any of the crimes charged in this indictment if the government has proved each of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, some of these counts require proof beyond a reasonable doubt and some do not. That is, some require an overt act and some do not. The instructions for each count will state specific directions. If an overt act is required, then the act itself does not have to be unlawful. An unlawful act may be an element of the crime if it was done for the purpose of carrying out the conspiracy. Now, the government is not required to prove that the defendant did one of the overt acts. Once you have decided that he was a member of the conspiracy, he is responsible for what the other said or did to carry out the plan, whether or not he knew what they said or did. When proof of, and then we'll get ready for your 160 number two jury charge. It says no proper names, let me make sure. Mm, I don't see any, okay? This is gonna be then 160 jury charge number two for five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defendant has heretofore been found guilty of the offense of murder, and it is now your function to determine the issue raised by the defendant's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. Such plea now places before you the issue as to whether or not he was sane or insane at the time of the commission of the offense. This is the sole issue for you to determine in this proceeding. Although you may consider evidence of his mental state before and after the time of the commission of the offense, such evidence is to be considered for the purpose of throwing light upon his mental condition as it was when the offense was committed. Insanity, as the word is used in these instructions, means a disease or deranged condition of the mind which renders a person incapable of knowing or understanding the nature and quality of his act or unable to distinguish right from wrong in relation to that act. The test of insanity is this. First, that did the defendant have sufficient mental capacity to know and understand what he was doing? And second, did he know and understand that it was wrong and a violation of the rights of another? To be sane and thus responsible to the law for the act committed, the defendant must be able to both know and understand the nature and quality of his act and to distinguish between right and wrong at the time of the commission of the offense. The defendant has the burden of proving his insanity by a preponderance of the evidence. By a preponderance of the evidence is meant such evidence as when weighed without opposed to it has more convincing force and the greater probability of truth. Mental illness or insanity is not necessarily synonymous with legal insanity. Mental illness or insanity in whatever other form it may appear is not a defense to the crime unless it meets the specific test of legal insanity heretofore stated to you. You are here, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, for the purpose of deciding whether or not a person charged in this court with a criminal offense is at the present time suffering from a disease of the mind and is so far insane as to be 
unable to comprehend the proceedings and to be incapable of conducting his defense if he were to be tried for that alleged offense. In these instructions, the person whose sanity is here in question will be designated as the defendant. This proceeding is not in any sense a criminal proceeding, and the innocence or guilt of the defendant of the criminal charge against him is not here involved. The sole question is whether or not he now is sufficiently sane to be tried for a criminal offense. And the purpose of this proceeding and of your verdict herein will be to answer that question. The test is as follows. If a person charged with a crime is capable of understanding the nature and purpose of the proceedings against him, if he comprehends his own status and condition in reference to such proceedings and is able to assist his attorney in conducting his defense or to conduct his own defense in a rational manner, he is to be deemed sane for the purpose of being tried for the crime charged against him, although on some subject his mind may be deranged or unsound. The defendant has the burden of proving by a preponderance of the evidence that he is presently insane. Preponderance of the evidence means such evidence as when weighed with that opposed to it has more convincing force and the greater probability of truth. The question of insanity which is presented on the issue now being tried before you is different from that involved where insanity is alleged to have existed at the time of the commission of the offense and is made a defense to the charge. Where insanity is relied upon as a defense to a charge of crime, the inquiry must be as to whether or not the defendant at the time of the commission of the alleged offense knew the difference between right and wrong or could distinguish the nap nature or quality and consequences of his act. But where, as here, an issue has been joined as to whether or not he is now mentally competent, the question to be determined is whether or not he now is mentally competent to make a rational defense to the accusation of crime made against him. A person may have been sane enough to be responsible for a crime and yet at the time of trial be incapable by reason of insanity of making his defense. And on the other hand, okay, you also, that concludes our test. Make sure that you're typing them up so you know how you're doing. You all, very important, uh, get them graded, okay? Have a great day, you all.